Joining me until 7 o'clock, my panel this evening, Professor of Politics at the University of Kent, Matt Goodwin, and broadcast journalist, Judita De Silva. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Now, I want to hear from you as well. GBnews.com forward slash your say, of course, is our new comments section that I'll be looking at throughout the show. So, immigration, the ECHR, net zero and trans ideology. In the past few weeks, there have been various people calling for referendums on all of these major issues. Do we need more direct democracy? Do we need to have more referendums on major issues? Right, Matt, let me come to you first. This is something that you mentioned in one of your most recent articles on your Substack. What brought up this topic for you? Well, I think that particular article, I was, I was looking at what could Rishi Sunak do to kind of bring back all of those disillusioned Conservatives. And I've surveyed all of the people who have been going over to the Reform Party and I said, look, what, what would bring you back? And they mm. said, well, we want a big, bold offer on immigration. You know, we want net migration slashed or potentially leave the European Convention on Human Rights. And my suggestion is, look, actually, one, one such offer for Rishi Sunak could be let's have... let's let's. Let's really speak to this question about mass immigration once and for all. Let's have a national conversation, a referendum on reducing uh, levels of immigration into Britain. Uh, and I think that's the only thing Rishi Sunak really could do to try and turn around his fortunes. Because what that speaks to, actually, is a sense that the British public don't feel heard. I think po possibly more than at any other time. We've had such a disruptive last four years, haven't we, Judita? But... What is it at the moment that people feel so frustrated about? Is it the fact that we have had unelected prime ministers, maybe? What's going on that people wish... There seems to be, I think, a mood of the nation, and people will tell us at home tonight, that we do want to have more regular referendums on the big issues. Um, I don't know if it's so much about that. I do think it's a knock-on effect since what happened with um, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, where the country did feel that they were all clamouring for a certain outcome, but there was a, a sort of inaction from people in power. And you then question yourself, what is the value of my vote if I have put you in there to represent me, but when I speak up for an opinion, you do not represent that? But then when you think of the referendums, you cannot re kind of descend into a situation where you have leaders who are effectively warm bodies in positions while they let people govern themselves. Because at the same time, the reason you elect leaders is because you believe they can find a pragmatic middle ground to represent everyone. Whether or not you're conservative of la or Labour, when you're in power, you represent everyone. But does that mean then that there's a sense also that manifestos have not been kept to? Because we voted... It might just be that this is because we are in an election year. So maybe the public is clamouring to have their say. Um, but it also speaks to this idea that manifesto promises aren't being met. It's, it's always going to be a balancing act because in every country you have a manifesto that kind of is you waving a flag saying this is what I will do on my crusade as leader. But when you get into power, like I said, you have to represent everyone. So you find out what is it I can get through towards that, ma that manifesto I pledged myself mm -hmm. on. The closest middle ground I can get to that without alienating effectively the other side of the population that didn't vote for me. So any leader is always going to get to a point that when they then do a, like, a, they collate what you achieved during your time in office. How closely did you meet your markers, knowing that it is impossible to meet all of them? Mm. Do you think Prime Ministers do wish to do that once they get in office, to keep everyone happy all of the time? Well, on many of these big issues that we've been talking about this week, for example, um, you know, we've got gender ideology with the CAS review, we've yeah. got immigration, leaving the ECHR, stopping the small boats. I think the fundamental problem in many Western democracies is that the elites who are presiding over the political system uh, and also the cultural and, the, and, and a large chunk of the media elite, too, who mm. shape the national mm. conversation, don't actually represent the vast majority of people on these issues. So migration would be a great example. Uh, we know that in more than 80% of constituencies in this country, a majority of people want to dramatically reduce the amount of immigration into Britain. But we also know that the political elites in charge of Westminster have been putting the pedal down on that issue, largely ignoring what they promised voters in their own manifesto. So the direct Democrats would argue, and I'm with them on this one, actually, that when you get a really important issue to voters, like Brexit and our relationship with Europe, like migration, I would also argue, like what we're doing to kids with mm. gender ideology, which, in my view, at least, is is nothing short of child abuse, and we can come back and talk about that. But some issues are so important to people, they actually need to be taken out of the mm. daily, weekly discussion in Westminster. And we need to decide, as a community, where do we want to go on that particular issue? But how regularly, Matt, would you have to have those sorts of debates to try and keep more of the people happy more of the time? 
Well, I mean, it depends. If you look at a democracy like Switzerland, they have referendums on a much more regular basis. I think, you know, other European democracies, the Netherlands, France, they've had big referendums on mm. the Europe question. We've had one on Brexit. We've had one on AV reform, changing the election system. I think it would be very plausible, reasonable for Rishi Sunak to come out and say, look, enough is enough on this question. We either control our own borders or we don't. So what I'm going to do is, is take this to the British people and I'm going to say, if you vote for me and the Conservatives, I understand understand why many people out there would perhaps be distrustful of that pledge. But if you vote for me, um, within a week, I will bring forward legislation to give you a referendum on leaving the ECHR and regaining control of your borders. Personally, I think that would be very popular among the voters who needs to win back. Would you like to see that, Judith? Um, I think that certain things, I do agree that certain things have to go to a referendum because they speak fundamentally to the way individuals live their private lives every day, like the trans and the, the gender debate, 100%. But I do think that you open the floodgates with certain issues for when you have extremists within the population because there's always, there's, on one hand, there's a conversation about everyday people feeling that I can't deal with this community, I feel under threat by that community. And a referendum basically gives you an opportunity to wield power in numbers to oppress them in a way that would only basically ca would cause a flare-up, effectively a quote-unquote civil war. We've never lived in a time when everything is so binary. Like, there is so much division now. We could list five topics where you, you have to feel this way and yeah. I have to well, feel this way. And, yeah. and this maybe would be good, then, in a referendum culture. Can I, can I just push back on yeah, you a sure. little bit on that? Because w when you look at issues like what we're doing to kids with uh, puberty blockers and medical transitioning, mm. uh, or when you look at immigration, or when you look at stopping the small boats, much of the uh, elite class would say, well, this is divisive. This is, you know, driving a wedge down the, down the country and splitting 50% from 50%. I'm a pollster. Uh, mm. I know what people think about these issues. And on many of them, and this is what worries the elite, on many of them, it's 75, 80% of people saying, you know what, we shouldn't call pregnant mothers pregnant persons. Mm -hmm. You know what, we shouldn't allow 16-year-olds to change their uh, gender without medical supervision. You know what, we should reduce levels of migration because they're too high. You know what, we should do whatever we need to do to control our own borders. So the reason I think the elites don't want to open up this conversation like they did with Brexit is because yeah. they know they will often lose these big debates. Could that be the truth? I don't think so. I think it's it's halfway. I think that there should be more referendums when it comes to social issues. The trans conversation is a very social issue. When you're talking about political and structural functionality, that is something that the, the government is obligated to take the lead on. That's why you're in that position. So I think you have to you delineate... Mean things like tax, maybe, yes, or you don't... how you structure the NHS. Exactly, with because that... with every individual, my life is very different to yours when we talk mm. about finances and how we deal with those practical um, realities. But social things are more unifying because you have a, a larger swathe of people that can feel the same yeah. way. And, and social things are, are often... It's that distinction between the public and the private, yeah. actually. Social things are often behind closed doors. But in a way, maybe that's the stuff that is difficult to have a referendum on, because surely that's the stuff as individuals we are just in control of anyway. Well, I think there are questions that are existential for the national community. And our relationship with a supranational institution like the EU was one such question, because it fundamentally it was about who are we? Mm. It was the biggest question a country can ask. What is our identity? And in the same way, questions like, um, you know, should we should we reduce migration? How do we control our borders? Um, net sh zero. Should we have more police on the streets? So should we reform our, our net zero policies? Uh, these are these are fundamental questions about the national community. Mm. And I think that's look. The message of Brexit, Beverly. And I know you know this, and many of the people watching was that people actually. They want to have more voice in yeah. politics. They don't want less. They don't want more quangos. They don't yeah. want more unelected bureaucrats. They want more of a voice to ch affect the decisions that affect their lives, right? So, so let's lean into that. Let's have more democracy. Which doesn't sound party political. It doesn't, but... And uh, therefore, maybe it, maybe Matt's right in terms of the fact that it is just a, a very small elite, we could call them the globalist elite, who want to retain the power and the control of the little people. And the last time they opened that can of worms with Brexit, it didn't go the way that they thought it might go. Exactly. <laughs> but then you also have to realise that a lot of the time, the reason it's kind of there's a duality that every individual has where I know how I feel, I know what I want, but I do defer to you because I know you know more. All the minutiae of actually governing a country is stuff that goes above the heads of the general population, and we don't want to spend our time thinking about that, so we defer to politicians. Oh, I'm not but, sure but about just that. Just on that, just yeah. on that. 
So the, one of the popular ideas after Brexit was let's have, uh, let's go back to rule of the elites. Now, the problem with the elite class, as we've seen this week with the CAS review, mm -hmm. is actually, guess what? Um, they're not as competent and they're not as uh, evidence-driven as they like to suggest. Let's think about foreign policy, the forever wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the ca catastrophic failures in Libya, uh, in, in Syria. Let's think about inequality and their failure to reduce levels of inequality in this country or to just control our borders. Mm. I, I, I get very nervous when people say, well, you must hand over trust and faith in the expert class, when, as we've seen again this week, you know, with the CAS review, um, the expert class basically abdicated their responsibility. And I, I don't want to zoom in on that specific mm. example too much, but one of the most shocking things in Britain this week for me was the revelation that many experts were refusing to even participate with that review, were refusing to hand yeah. over data and evidence because they put dogma ahead of evidence. Well, they put profit ahead of evidence as well, because I would say in that situation it was the pharmaceutical companies that didn't want to collaborate with some of the cast it, review because, a, the, the, because a lot of the children were effectively guinea pigs in that, it, which, which does sort of tie into this issue as well, because if the public are voting on these fundamental issues, it also can take away some of the power from the people who might be funding various lobbying groups. Indeed, because take the ECHR and I'm, taking, I'm going to look at it from two perspectives. When a lot of people talk about we do not need a, he keeps saying, a foreign body governing our functionality, OK, that's fine. What you have to understand is that when you listen to the discourse in other countries, a lot of them say that. The UK has to be very mindful that even though you have legacy and influence and prestige, the UK is a small island. That legacy and prestige was built on affiliations and partnerships and coalitions with other countries around the world. If you continu continuously make moves that make you look like you think you can stand alone against a governing body that looks after a whole, a whole swathe of countries, then you're alienating yourself and isolating yourself mm. and then you have to oh. deal with consequence. Although I suppose the obvious comeback to that would be that if you look at the UK, we are a member of the G7, we're a member of NATO, we've just signed AUKUS, we are falling over ourselves to sign trade deals with other countries around the world. This particular issue of the ECHR is really about, are we a self-governing, independent nation that can control our own borders, that can control who's coming in and who's going out, that can deport foreign criminals who are murdering uh, and raping um, British uh, uh, people, or are we not? And I think that question, to go back to the referendum point, mm. this is as, as existential as you can get for a nation. No, but do you see how specific you got with describing the problem lines, which anyone would agree with, but what's the, the rhetoric around it is about dealing in numbers, cut 700,000 down to 100,000. That doesn't go into the minutia of the individual people who ought not to be here and those who have a valid right to apply to be here and stay. Day. Hmm. When you deal with using big numbers and overall policy to govern something that should be isolated on a case by case basis, you're conflating the argument. And that's why people get kind of frustrated about it, where those, just, those who just want to see numbers reduced, like just make a policy, just protect our borders. But those who are on the receiving end of what the brunt of that will say, hmm. why am I being treated like a war criminal? Well, as Thomas Sowell once said, immigration is one of the only issues which is talked about in terms of how to help people break the law. Uh, and that's what this conversation always mm. reduces itself to, which is how do we help people break the law? Actually, most British people out there are thinking it's nuts that we've got 118,000 people entering Britain illegally, which the security services, by the way, which we tend to forget, mm. have said um, is a direct security threat to the country and needs to be monitored. So and we... I think, just in terms of this referendum debate, though, one of the interesting things is how... Would you, what was the f stats recently, Matt, about the percentage of immigration that people thought there was compared to what there actually is? Well, Wasn't it the people the average, think it's 10% of what it really is? The average estimate, if you ask voters in this country to estimate what net migration is, the average estimate was 70,000 a year. Right. Now, of course, the reality is it's 700,000 yeah, it a year. Yeah. Now, the, as you're right, actually, the ECHR issue won't fix legal migration, right? Yeah. So that's about government mm. policy. But in terms of doing what we can to defend our national borders, to deport people who break the law, yeah. uh, leaving the ECHR, I think, will be the next logical step in this debate. Okay.